Hi, my name is Yi Gu. Thank you for watching this video. This is a brief introduction of my book, Chinese Ways of Seeing and Open Air Painting, recently published by Harvard University Asian Center Press. It often came as a surprise that pre-modern Chinese painters rarely painted outdoors. Open air painting was so alien in China that when Chinese art students began to paint outdoors in the mid-1910s, they were interrogated by policemen for their suspicious and alien behavior. However, by the early 1930s, open air painting became extremely popular and continued to remain so. In this book, I examine waves of campaigns for open air painting from the late 1910s to the outbreak of the Cultural Revolution, with an epilogue looking at contemporary China. I discover that central to the pursuit of open air painting was a repeatedly reinvigorated and ever growing urgency to see in a way suitable for the Chinese people and to see the Chinese homeland in a correct way. Never before in Chinese history had there been such intense reflection on ways of seeing. This shift, which I propose to call an ocular turn, reveals the initial formation of a modern subject who had a little ground to envision him or herself as independent from the collectivity known as the nation state. This book describes the mutual consolidation of stylistic pursuits, epistemological shifts, and the nation building through five chapters. The first chapter looks at how open air painting became the most legitimate way of depicting landscape after young Chinese painters embraced the xieshen, sketching from life, as a necessary cognitive skill for citizens capable of scientific observation. Proudly painting outdoors, painters positioned themselves as the vanguard and model of the new national subject, documenting, analyzing, and eulogizing the homeland on behalf of the people. Chapter 2 looks at terms such as qu jing, view taking, gou tu, composition, and tou shi, perspective, which are all used in Mandarin today. It demonstrates how Chinese painters struggled to regulate their vision with the fixed viewpoint, the 60-degree visual field, and other optical rules based on Euclidean geometry. More importantly, I examine how Chinese painters reconciled the majestic view in monumental landscape painting with this new optical rule through case studies on Mount Huang and West Lake. These endeavors led to the rise of a highly gendered art discourse that held the masculine majesty as the representative aesthetic mode of China. Chapter 3 looks at how painters wrote sketching from life xieshen, back into the history of Chinese painting. As a result, they brought fundamental changes to the very tradition they set out to preserve. For instance, they reinvented the meaning and practice of textual modeling strokes known as cun, cun fa, and declared that instead of linear perspective with single point of view, Chinese perspective has, has multiple or mobile viewpoints. The next two chapters look at how heightened political crisis prompted the new campaigns for open air painting. Chapter 4 focuses on a case study of the artist Guan Shanyue, who was a rising young star at the time. Under the pressure to see the motherland as resilient, productive, he and his generation of artists further embraced the pursuit of masculine majesty. Chapter 5 is about the socialist era. From the dominance of socialist realism to the call for a combination of revolutionary realism and revolutionary romanticism, the party state incessantly demanded artists to produce works with renewed effective power. The most important discovery of this chapter is that the state control is not always against, but often for stylistic innovation, which by itself became an essential means of the party of the party's control of artistic production. I hope that the book would shed a new light on three lines of inquiry. First of all, 
open air painting allows us to examine a moment when multiple and fluctuating ideas of Chinese art and Western art began to stabilize and ossify. While adopting, questioning, and redefining open air painting and the Cartesian perspectivalism behind it, Chinese artists were under immense pressure to defend their culture against the epistemological violence of Western imperialism. My book is sympathetic to their position, and I try to fully acknowledge the pain caused by that violence. But at the same time, I want to point out, in order to grapple with that pressure, Chinese artists and the cultural elites did not challenge the logic of cultural hierarchies but instead devoted their efforts to transform China from a victim of discrimination to an offender. Second, I hope to call for a more nuanced way to describe the relationship between art and power, between artist and the state. The two paintings on screen are by the same painter, He Tianjian, about two decades apart. The development of open air painting in China demonstrates continual, ever-intensified attempts initiated by the painters to see a strong homeland before the existence of a strong nation state. That made it easy for them to embrace the view of the state, even when the state, first the nationalist and then socialist, became increasingly coercive and oppressive. In other words, other than imagining Chinese artists persecuted by the state, and expressing their creativity by the candlelight, we might want to understand the complicated role they played in helping the state for social education and control. Thirdly, echoing the efforts of writing global modern art histories, my book brings to light new points of contact and sites of exchange. British menus on watercolor via Japanese watercolorists interpretation, perspective treatises by a largely forgotten French painter thanks to the translation of a Chinese Jesu, um, photography menus on composition by American amateurs. The Western elements in this list have received little scholarly attention. It reminds us that the attention or lack of attention is far from a simple question of West versus East or Euro-America versus the Global South, but of modernist canon and those, and those excluded by the canon formation. I'm grateful to my editors and the designers for producing a beautiful book with many reproductions of paintings that never appeared in English publication before. My book also on a large number of painting treatises and even grade school textbooks, which are not in public collections, but acquired through years of scavenging in secondhand book market. Last but not least, I want to thank the many individuals, institutions, and grants, especially my amazing editors at Harvard University Asian Center Press. I hope that you would be intrigued by this introduction and read my book, either by purchasing or borrowing a copy from library. Welcome to contact me with comments. Many thanks again for watching.